Morning, everybody. Welcome to APIP's Spring Partner Meeting. If anybody is out there on the Zoom screen, can you wave? Or Kenneth, can you wave and tell me if you can hear me? Yay, we've got technology to work. <laughs> Great. <laughs> For those of you who don't know me, my name is Tamara Van Rijn, and I'm the director of the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program for the Nature Conservancy. Just so thrilled to have you all here today. This is the first time since the pandemic that we've been able to have our partners in person, and that is delightful. And one thing we learned through the pandemic was that we know how to have meetings on Zoom. So even if my back is to some of you on the Zoom screen, hi, <laughs> welcome to via Zoom as well. Really great to have everybody on Zoom today as well as here for this meeting. That's right, I'm gonna run the slides this way. I'm going to advance the screen. You might need to click on the slide just to okay. make it active. Yeah. Oh, Hold on, just a little technology. I turned my screen off momentarily. Why? <laughs> All right. Where are you going? Okay. <laughs> Down. All right. Um, so yeah, a little. You know, hey, we've been doing Zooms for three years, um, but we haven't been doing hybrid. So I'm just going to say we get to reset today and learn how to do this all over again. Uh, so just a quick overview of what we hope to do today and some welcome and introductions. I hope some of you who are in person got to meet each other over our little bit of coffee time. And if not, we'll have a chance after the formal presentations uh, to talk a little bit about what APIP's plans are, talk a little bit about roles for our partners this summer. And then I really can't wait to turn it over to Brian to share our new AIS vulnerability analysis, uh, five years worth of data that Ezra and his crew have collected. We've got a new analysis of how that can help you with managing your lakes. And I know there are already some people here who are frustrated with knotweed, so we're going to tell you what we've learned about knotweed management. And we'll also talk a little bit about just what's happening with hemlock woolly adelgid, particularly in the Lake George region, because that matters to all of us. So um, those of you who know and have been to these meetings before know that I usually like to start with a bit of a reading. Um, in this case, I went on a little history journey in my head. Um, and I was recently at a meeting where someone said, before you manage a species, you should think about the cultural and historic context of that species. And so I've been thinking a lot about hemlock lately. And Zach will talk a little bit about hemlock later. And uh, I was able not to find a lot about how Native Americans used hemlock. It seems to be used primarily for medicinal purposes. And the Native Americans were using brains for tanning, animal brains for tanning. And the white settlers, however, used hemlock for tanning. And that really changed the character of a lot of our landscape. So a lot of what I'm just going to summarize is in this great book by Barbara McMartin about the great forest of the Adirondacks. But in 1840, according to the U.S. Census, there were 270 tanneries in the 11 Adirondack counties. And so as you can see in this slide, which is courtesy of the Blue Mountain Museum, the hemlock trees were cut for, for their bark and they were stripped. The trees were left in the woods and the bark was then carted out, usually by wagon to the nearest rail or canal, and then ground by the tanneries into tannin. And it was used to tan cow hides that came from Central and South America. It was cheaper to ship up the hides than it was to ship down the bark. So this is what I found interesting though, is that the communities that were spawned by the tanneries became centers of, farm, of commerce. And that the tanneries accounted for more building of towns than the logging industry ever did. Because the logging industry was more transient and these tanneries, there were about 50 big ones required giant infrastructure and buildings. And they also had a lot of farming communities on the edges to provide food for all the people who were working in the tanneries. So 
Many of these tanneries um, required about a thousand acres of hemlocks to be cut each year as bark for their tanneries. And so again, from that period of 1850 to 1890, tanneries accounted for more clearing of land, again, than logging did. Some of that shifted as the tanning industry left and as permanent sawmills got set up and then as the pulp industry came in. But again, this is what I found interesting. Conservatively, McMartin says that over a million acres were cut for the tan bark industry, mostly in Warren County. And then when the industry left the area, only about one third to one half of those original hemlock stands remained. And what I think is so cool about that is that hemlocks are really just indicative of our landscape here. And when you go through particularly Warren County and through much of the Adirondacks, that tree is so resilient. So even though more than a million acres of it was cut, we now have the ones that survived and their progeny as part of our landscape. So we'll talk some about hemlock oleodelgia today, but it's really good to remember, it's a pretty resilient tree. And with that, I'll switch from the history lesson to just a little quick overview of what ATIP has been up to and is gonna be up to this summer. So I, we have forest pest hunters. Some of them are here. Thank you, forest pest hunters. <laughs> and we have some on the screen. And again, I'm sorry the folks on the screen don't get to see me, but um, the, the forest pest hunters, for those of you who don't know, that is our volunteer forest pest program. And it's very similar to the lake protectors that we have in the summer. Um, Kathy, I'll say thank you on behalf of Bill, who is one of our, uh, uh, one of our star forest pest hunters. Um, this year was, I, I can't even say how phenomenal it was, and a lot of thanks to Bill and Dom and to the other volunteers who were out there, but we had 884 records entered into HiMap. I don't know if that's a record it's in this case. It's a record. <laughs> Thank you. And we found 212 new uh, infestations or areas that were unknown to us. And again, Zach's going to talk a little bit about that. Um, but our, these volunteers dedicated over 300 hours this winter, which is just phenomenal. So we have a lot of work now switching from there into our summer work plan. Um, we have Megan Grega back with us for the third season, which is great. We're delighted to have her here before she goes off, off to grad school. And we have a forest pest assistant who will be starting this year. Last year, we surveyed for five different forest pests across the park. We also have our campground steward, Becca Tamagna, who's coming back for a second year. Um, and we have our crew from Invasive Plant Control. They'll be out for nine and a half weeks doing survey and control. We do um, actually manage forest pests, most of the forest pest management on forest preserve land we do on behalf of DEC. And we also do um, invasive control on behalf of DOT. So um, we have a lot of things. We're gonna do all the DEC campgrounds again. Uh, we monitor all those. We've been able to reduce garlic mustard um, by 90 some percent across the, all of the campgrounds since we've been managing it. We'll be um, working on several projects, including some biocontrols, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and I did promise in the sneak preview for today that we're going to be also focusing on a couple of those highest threat species. So I know some of you want to know about knotweed, and that is great. And knotweed is ubiquitous across the park, and we all need to do our part for that. Where APIP is focusing most of its efforts to control invasive species are the ones that we still have a chance to either eradicate or contain. And so um, we've come fairly close on giant hogweed. There are only a few surviving plants left in the Adirondacks. We have one population of something called mile a minute up north, and that is also relatively controlled. Tree of Heaven. Tree of Heaven is the alternate host for spotted lanternfly. You probably have heard a lot about spotted lanternfly. We have a few landowners in the Lake George area who have tree of heaven, and we do have the ability to have an arborist come in and help remove, help the landowner remove those trees. We want them gone. We only have about 10 trees that we know about, but if you, uh, if you have any connections with those landowners or you know some people, particularly in the Hadlock Pond area, talk to Becca, because we're trying to make sure those trees aren't here because that'll help keep spotted lantern fly out of our area. Um, and wineberry is another one that we just found last year um, in the Lake George area for the first time. Then we're always on the lookout for new ones. 
Um, and we'll be having some programming later this summer where you can learn some of these, but these are new for us to be thinking about. These are not here yet, but they're the ones we wanna watch for. So we've got carpet grass, Japanese snowball, Japanese hops, and oak wool. And again, we've got some great information just new and up on our website for these. So one project we're really excited about this summer is we're working with a private landowner in Warren County, and we have been approved by USDA to be able to get a certain type of parasitic wasp that will eat the larvae of the emerald ash borer trees. And so it's a very competitive process. They only pick a certain number of sites each year because only the federal government can rear these wasps and ship mm -hmm. them out. But we've been approved, we and the landowner have been approved for this. So our forest pest seasonal will be getting shipments of wasps every two weeks and bringing them out. And we're gonna see, we'll get the wasps for two years in a row and then monitor for two years to see if they can establish. But that's really exciting. It's the first time that there's been any biological control in Warren County. So that will give us some hope for our ash. Quickly moving to aquatics, because that's another big part of what we do. Um, thanks to Ezra, we'll be having the early detection team again this year, and we're back up to region three this year in terms of where we'll be monitoring. And we also have our APIP staff who will be doing some monitoring and uh, our new seasonal for the summer also out monitoring. And um, our staff will be working on a couple of projects and be, feel free to talk with Brian or if you're on Zoom, emailing Brian to find out more about these. We're in uh, the first full year of a project we're doing on Lake Champlain. We wanna see if we can remove the number of boats coming out of the lake with milfoil on them by doing some targeted removal and hand harvesting at milfoil just at these really infested launches. It's a great project we're doing in partnership with AWI and the watershed stewards and the water stewards, because that's how we're going to know whether boats are coming out cleaner. So we'll be actually managing on five different boat launches this year, and that's funded with the Lake Champlain Basin Program. And last summer, we did our first monitoring um, with environmental DNA in our aquatic systems, and we learned a lot about that. Um, and we're still trying to figure out what the results showed, but no new infestations that we didn't know about in the Adirondacks of the few species we looked for. But Brian's going to be leading up a much bigger project this summer, and our summer seasonal is going to help with that. We do know some lake associations are interested in that, and Brian's been working with a lab to try and get um, a rate that might uh, a rate for testing that might be sort of a bulk rate if if the lake associations want to come in and pay for their samples to be done at the same time. But more to come on that, but that's a pretty exciting piece for us. And of course, tons of ways for you all to get involved. Um, thank you to those of you who are on the phone and some of you who I know are in the room who are our volunteer lake protectors. Um, we'll be having, great to have all of you out. Last year was our highest number of lakes surveyed ever. Thanks again to our lake protectors and a partnership with AWI. So the training for that will be in June. Some of you already know how to do it, so you can get right out and get started. Um, and we'll have we'll have our map up soon, right? We'll have it by, by June. Yeah, we'll have the map up that you can adopt your lake by June. Someone's ringing. <laughs> All right, and then Lake Management Tracker. There's a couple of lakes here who are already in Lake Management Tracker. We've had about 10 lakes go through it. Um, some lakes ebb and flow. But it's really exciting to see if for those lakes who have been in it for a number of years, you can track how milfoil growth, uh, you know, how much growth you still have of milfoil and where it is and compare that to where your community is putting in money to harvest to figure out if the harvesting is having the intended effect or not. And so we get some great maps. Um, that Brian helps put together for those lake associations. And the idea is that'll help lakes with their lake management plan. So again, see Brian, if you want to get more involved in either of those programs. And thanks to Sean Kittle, who some of you know, or Sean is our communications coordinator. He, is, he will came on just about a year ago. Um, and so he's been putting together our great winter webinar series and our summer series is just about to begin. So Becca will be leading a Backyard Invasives webinar uh, in May. So if you want to learn about how to manage some of these species in your own backyard, we'll do Invasive Species Awareness Week. Um, anybody who wants to do an activity during Invasive Species Awareness Week, join us. 
We'll be doing uh, one workshop on June 9th. We're still trying to get the, together the details, but how to take a good photo so you can upload it to IMAP Invasives so that when our staff are trying to verify if that really is the insect or the pest or the plant, we can see the photo. So more to come on that. No. <laughs> Job. This is for everybody who hasn't learned that yet. <laughs> Actually, many of you do a great job, but it is true as you upload things, we do then use those photos to verify. Lake Protector Training on June 21st. We'll have a couple of field days for that as well, still to come. Um, we'll do best management practices for highway personnel. So this is really great if you have town highway crews and you want to make sure that they're not like mowing the knotweed or the wild parsnip and spreading it all along the highways, ask them to come to this webinar and it'll be recorded. So on a rainy day, they can just watch it in the highway garage. And then the forest pest hunters will start up again in August for those who want to start surveying for beech leaf disease. So we have a lot of things coming up. Um, all of our webinars usually start at about 10. Um, you can register more for there. And the recordings are also available. And Sean and I were just looking at the stats. Last year at this time, we'd had 4,000 lifetime views on our YouTube channel. Whatever. This year, we've had 12,000 lifetime views on our YouTube channel. So we've basically had 8,000 different views this year. It's a great resource if you want to watch any of our webinars um, at your, on your own time. We have outreach materials. Some of you have picked them up already. Um, this is our newest piece, the Field Guide for Terrestrial Invasives in the Adirondacks. We've got a bunch of those for if you want to take some of those. We have lots of the Protect Your Forests and Protect Your Waters if you need a stack, a case, whatever to take home to stack up in your area. Um, let us know. We have them for those of you who are here. We have them in the basement. For those of you who are online, you can order them through our website. Um, so please make sure you take advantage of our outreach materials. And last but certainly not quite least, we have a lot of research and innovation projects that um, Zach is heading up. We're still continuing a project to look at what's the impact of deer on the regeneration here in the Adirondacks. That's a big issue, especially as we have some, if we end up having more mortality due to forest pests, are we going to get the regeneration? Becca is leading up our process to look for lingering ash trees, so monitoring and managing ash. We have five plots that we do, one of them in partnership with Lake Jordan Land Conservancy, and one of them with the Welsh Whitrig family up in Chattagay. Um, by, I'm also working with a group regionally to develop a similar protocol for monitoring hemlock health. We have a draft about that out for peer review right now. And then by next summer, we hope to have a region-wide system like across Maine all the way down to the Carolinas to be monitoring for hemlock health. And then you're gonna hear today about the work on knotweed, hemlock oleodelgid, and our AIS vulner vulnerability. Before I pass it on to my, my uh, colleagues here, I did want to talk a little bit. That's all about what APIP is doing, right? So when I, um, we had a, a, the strategic plan that we created last year, we had some great discussions. So when I usually say APIP now, I'm kind of thinking about our staff who are housed here at the Nature Conservancy, as well as all of our partners, but all of our partners are contributing to all of the work across the Adirondack Prism. And so one of the things we tried to do in our strategic plan last year was to kind of formalize what is it to what does it mean to be an APIP partner? And in fact, as I was looking through the partner list on our website, um, there are at least two organizations that were on the list that don't exist anymore. So it was time to refresh the website um, and refresh our partner list. I've reached out to a few organizations that haven't been involved at all in the last few years and they're no longer um, a part of our partner list. And I've started reaching out to a few organizations that for some reason had not been listed as a partner, um, but have been active with us all along. So we're trying to come up with a better way that we can not only know sort of who's partnering, but also be able to roll up the work that all of us are doing so that we can show the cumulative impact of what, you know, however many, how many people do we have on Becca? 
It's 33 people. On. Yeah, 33 people on. So, I mean, we have 30 or 40 organizations and hundreds of volunteers, and there's no one place that rolls up the cumulative impact of that. So part of this trying to specify what is a partner will help us then figure out how we can collectively calculate what we're doing. So um, if your organization is not yet a partner, um, it's fun. You get to hang out with really cool people, like the people on this Zoom and the people in this room. And we have a lot of expertise amongst the groups here and amongst our APIP staff that we can share around. We do like to list our partners in our annual report and on our website. And then the idea is that we would start representing the collective work on a new data dashboard. So, but just a minute on that. So these are the benefits of being the partner. And what we ask for partners in return, we don't ask you for money. We want just people to get involved. There is a Adirondack Prism mission that came last year that we refined last year. And there are four goals in the strategic plan. And I was gonna, I have some copies. I'll grab them before folks leave from this room and I can post them in the chat, the two page summary um, of the strategic plan. But we have a goal of protect your land, protect your water, engage the communities and engage in research. So what we ask our partners to do is pretty simple. Come to one of these um, or participate in a working group or partner with us on a project. Like we've got the monitoring and managing ash projects. We're doing lake protector work with uh, and lake management tracker with a number of lake associations. And then hopefully be able to contribute to this partner dashboard. So some of you heard us talk about the dashboard at our fall partner meeting. And then thanks to Zach Sinek, we did a beta test. A few of you tested the form to see if it worked. And then we sent that back out to almost everybody we had on our partner list to say, hey, what did you do last year? Let's see if this works. So we got 17 responses. Um, and this is some of what we found. Um, so. We had seven of the partners, seven of the 17, who said they were doing research. So that is great news. We found out about research we didn't know about. So that's great. Eventually, we can have a website that could actually back up some of this data. Um, but 23 different research projects going on here. Um, we had um, nine lake associations report and five governments two nonprofits and one private um, report. So this is a nice place where we're rolling up some of the boat steward data. All of you know that Adirondack Watershed Institute does the, the yeoman's work of, of the boat stewards. And there are a lot of other lake associations who may be having one or two stewards at various places. So we had three boat stewards reporting and then we we're able to kind of roll up the data from all of the boat stewards. I think that's what's interesting too, is until we started really thinking about this dashboard, we know a lot of the lake associations are spending money to manage lakes. There's no one source that says, oh my God, lakes in the Adir lake associations in the Adirondack raised from their community pockets, basically, X millions of dollars this year to manage milk oil. So with this dashboard, you would be able to report those activities. So we have 10 different organizations of the 17 who are, um, who are surveying for managing aquatic species. And again, we can see which species are found, which species are most common. This is not gonna be the final picture of the dashboard. This was put together just for today. And thanks to Zach for that. We'll be working with someone to kind of um, put it into like more of a storyline and also put it maybe probably put it on two pages so you don't have to cram it all into one. Um, so, and we found out that 10 organizations hosted 73 events and collectively we reached more than 2000 people. So um, are we gonna keep the data open any longer? The survey is still open. So if anyone here received that and looking around the room and hasn't replied yet, you're still more than welcome to do so. Yeah. So we would love to capture as much 2022 data as we can. And the reason we wanted to share this with you today is because we really want you to collect your data this summer. Because we'll come back to all of you in the fall or late. I think what we have found out from partners is they'd really like us to come back to them in about January once you start gathering and compiling all your data. We'll want to know, hey, what did you do um, related to invasive species in 2023? 
so that we can begin to show that cumulative impact. And what we hope is that this is, you know, not just for um, APIP, Nature Conservancy, DEC, is that you'll be able to take this, right? You'll be able to, uh, Caitlin and I have talked about this, but Hamilton County Soil and Water Conservation District, you'll be able to take this to your board and to be able to say, see, you know, even though, you know, you might think, hey, we only surveyed five lakes. Well, guess what? We were part of over 200 lakes that got surveyed because we were part of this effort. So the idea behind this dashboard is something that you can take to your boards and your donors and show them the larger roll up of your work. So um, I think we might, uh, for folks who are on today, we'll send the link around to the organizations um, who can still fill out that data dashboard survey. And um, I'll also have a link to the two-pager of the strategic plan. And with that, I have a couple minutes for any questions, and then I'm going to turn it over to Zach to talk about knotweed, which everybody wants to talk about. Any questions so far? Any questions coming up in the chat? Oh, no, right. We're going to Brian first. Well, we, can go to, we, can go to, we can go to that. <laughs> Sorry, I just threw them through curveball. We're going to stop sharing my screen. We're going to follow the agenda. Do I want to continue? Yes. I'm going to turn it over to Brian. Well, you really want to know about late home if, there's any, if there's any questions. Unless there's questions. No. That's you. That's you're going to, you're going to switch. Them, so I'm just going to close that one. Yeah, okay. Any questions coming up in chat, Becca, while we're doing a little transition? We just had a quick question of whether the survey was set, set up online or sent to selected partners, and that has entered that response in the chat that I posted on the survey was not posted publicly online. So it's available for anyone interested. Right. So um, we did not just put the survey out kind of big broadcast online because we are looking really for, in this case, organizations, lake associations, entities that we had known about. Uh, to, to trial it for this year. So uh, there is a link to that if your organization, and you know, we we um, have a list, we know who a lot of you are, so we send it out to the best list we can, but it could be that it's going into one person's box or one person's spam box. So if the whole notion of a partner dashboard survey is a mystery to you and say, I never saw that, just let us know, we can send it to you. It's possible that we didn't get to you or it's possible it went in your email and you, Quick delete. Um, doesn't matter. We can still get it to you. All right. Now I'm very delighted to turn it over to Brian, who's going to tell us about lake vulnerability. Okay. Um, awesome. This is uh, an exciting thing for me to do because I can actually remember, you know, a little bit over two years ago when I was getting interviewed. This was one of the questions uh, that that. They had for me about how how would you do this project because it was something that was put in the uh, two, two, 2019 to 2023 uh, planning uh, for the our, our our contract with DEC. So this is one of our deliverables. So this is a big thing that we knew we had to do, and um, it's built off a lot of great research that other people like Ezra and the Adirondack Research and, and partners all throughout here, our, our Lake Association, everybody's helped us with. So um, today's one of the first cracks of showing this off to everybody. Um, I'm always interested when you see these motivational posters, a lot of times they have lakes by them. And I don't know if lakes are just inspiring, but they, you, you, you've seen, you know, all these ones. And they always say like, okay, you know, anything's possible, you know, you can do everything, follow your dreams, you know? <laughs> and while I do believe that, you know, it is human species, if we do put, we prioritize things and put enough time and resource in it, we can accomplish, make great things. Look at what we did with the vaccine, look what we put people in, in space. Um, there's amazing things that we can do. So, um, so everything is possible with enough resources, but most of us are, oopsie, sorry. <laughs> looking, at wrong, looking at the wrong one. Most of us are limited by time and by money. So, um, you know, we can't do everything. And the analogy that I always use for people that you saw ahead is when I get to the beer aisle, there are so many beers there. Just like, this is unreal. Like, I'm never going to drink this many beers in my entire lifetime. Here, like, how can I possibly choose, um, you know, what beer I should choose for the day? 
So I've had to come up with a little rubric to kind of help me. And so this is uh, Brian's beer choosing option. So my first option is I just randomly grab something, you know, and we just, we'll just see what it goes through. It doesn't always work out the best. And you get some ones that are just like, oh, I'm not going to ever drink this again. So I've had to develop a beer prioritization model to help me <laughs> deal with that overwhelming selection. So my first category is what style of beer do I want to drink today? Is it a stout in the winter time or a Pilsner in the summer, an IPA? And then what brands do I like? Is it like Northway or Paradox or Dogfish Head? And so then usually when I can use these two selection criteria, it kind of narrows it down and I have a higher chance of having uh, success. So um, you're more than welcome to use this if you, <laughs> if you want to, if you are struggling like me. Well, let's think about lakes and AIS. Uh, does anyone want to guess how many water bodies are there in the Adirondack prism? 6.6 .6 million acres. You can, can you count up all these orange and red and blue dots? Who wants to guess? Does anybody? Come on, it's like price is right. Well, as long as you don't go over. Anything coming on in the chat? 3,000. 3,000, more than 3,000. So it's higher. Who wants to get the next? Except without going over. Yeah, 3,400. 3,400, more than 3,400. Look, look at all these little things right there. 6.6 .6 million acres. 5,025. 5,025. No, it's even higher than that. 10,000. Now we're starting to get close. It's more than 10,000. Yeah, 15. 15, yeah. 15. Okay, we've gone over 15. We have, when we go through and Zach and I do the GIS analysis of lakes, ponds, and large, um, you know, impounded streams, uh, 12,662 water bodies in our region. Um, and, and then does anybody off the top of their head, can they remember how many AIS species that uh, we have on our focus list that we track or through APIP? Too many. Too many. <laughs> through our aquatics, we have, we have 16. We have eight, eight plants and we have uh, eight animal species that we track. So if you take 12,662 water bodies and you raise that to the power of 16, it comes out to be a four with 65 zeros out of it. That's a potential combination. Um, and so this is just, you know, it's a limitless pool and combinations of what invasive species are gonna be there. So we need um, to come up with a system to help us uh, prioritize and figure out where we should be doing monitoring. So once again, up oh, wildfire. Well, so you know, in um, our 20 plus years of APIP working this, we've monitored over 483 lakes. That's only 3.8 percent of all water bodies in there. And but fortunately, the good news is because of the great work of our partners and people like AWI and uh, other people helping us with prevention, 76% um, of our lakes and water bodies have no AIS um, observed in them. So we really have one of um, the most unimpacted regions for uh, invasive species in, in the aquatics, in the United States. And so really this, um, you know, this is our favorite chart. I can't give a talk without doing this. You know, early detection is the real key for this because we need to find the species early to be able to possibly eradicate them or contain them at a much lower cost and at a much higher success rate. So, you know, this early detection is, is really key for it. So the question that we had was, um, how do we prioritize lakes for early detection monitoring? Well, we can go back to um, the, those two models that I suggested with my beer. We can just randomly, you know, just go out there, whatever lakes people like or, or, or on, they can just go out and, you know, okay, go monitor that lake, or, you know, monitor a different lake. Um, that's in many ways kind of a little bit how we've been doing it. That's kind of how like our lake protectors grow. We just want anybody to go out on a lake that they love um, and go out there and monitor. But we also could take another approach. We could use data to help us inform which lakes are most likely to be invaded and then try to prioritize those ones. So we're trying to get the most bang for our buck. Um, there has been some past research that we've done on this. So in 2017, my predecessor, Erin Vanny Volrath, um, she worked with Dr. Richard Shaker and used our AIS distribution to um, do a, a public research paper um, that found on the landscape level factors like um, 
you know, how far you are, you are, the closer you are to I-87, the more likely you are to be invaded. Uh, the larger your lake is, the more likely you are to be invaded. The closer you are to another lake that's already invaded, the more likely you're invaded. So we've already started to use some of this um, data for the past six years to kind of prioritize like where we're, we're going through. Um, so that, that's been a very great tool. And just this past year, just last year, um, we finished working in partnership with this, a uh, New York AIS pond and lake vulnerability. This was led by the New York Natural Heritage Program um, done across the state. And uh, I was on one of the steering committees, so I got to uh, help, help a little bit, but I was not deeply involved in it. So I'm not gonna take uh, very much credit. But um, the goal was to provide spatial information to help prioritize AIS surveys. And they used this this lens of thinking about the steps that it takes for an invasive species to first it has to be introduced to a lake. After it's been introduced to a lake, then it has to establish, it has to live, and it has to grow there. And then it has to have a negative impact on a lake. And so if you kind of go through this logistic model, this would give you your most vulnerable lakes that you can then use um, to prioritize. So um, Lakes at risk of introduction. Um, we use data like uh, boat traffic that the boat stewards are, are collecting. We use car uh, traffic data from DOT, um, the distance to other AIS that are in there and um, waterways that the waterway is connected to by, by a stream or by a connected lake. Um, these are all factors that increase the lake's risk of introduction. Um, Then we wanted to do that establishment piece. And so they created habitat models for um, water chestnut hydrilla, Eurasian water milfoil, starry stonewort, northern snakehead, rusty crayfish, spiny water flea, and zebra mussels. And these were chosen to be representative examples. So choosing a couple, a floating plant, two submerged plants, um, a macroalgae, a fish, um, and then you know some invertebrates um, in there. And so uh, you can, looking at, okay, what are the conditions within the lakes that would be most uh, likely to allow them to establish? But you can also use it, so say um, you're interested in variable leaf milfoil, we would suggest that you would use like either hydrilla or Eurasian water as like a proxy, like that a, a represents um, a, a submerged plant. If you're interested in another European frog, but you would use like water chestnut. So these are kind of representative examples because we couldn't do every single um, species. And then the last one, and this was the hardest one to kind of for us to do, was um, what is the potential impact? And they really came up and said that, um, you know, that a lake that had a higher value, so things like native fish richness, uh, rare plants and animals, had a higher biological assessment, that they would be, the impact would be greater in that. So um, these high quality lakes, if they were really invaded, they, they would have a larger impact than a, a water body that didn't have these high quality aspects beforehand. And um, yeah, and so this is the result. So there is a web application. So Sean, if you can stop sharing there, and then I will share right here. So this is through the New York Natural, Natural Heritage Program. So you can go online and I'll give a real quick. Brian, real quick while you're making the transition here, we had a question come in the chat about how we're defining things. Oh, that is a great question. <laughs> um, there is no standard definition of what is a lake. Is, is uh, East Kuroga and West Kuroga, is that two lakes or is that one lake? You know, uh, Canada Lake, is that? Canada Lake and Green Lake and West Lake are all one water body. Um, so there is no standard definition in science of what is a lake. Um, so we we usually default to uh, using either like a national database or a regional database that has already kind of defined that for us. Um, and these two projects that we talked about, they actually use two different databases um, for this. So uh, this one right here with the New York Natural Heritage Program, use the Nature Conservancy's lakes and ponds classification for the Northeast database um, for it. So um, this is, you're seeing, this is live. Um, anybody can, can log on 
and go to this. And so one of the first, so this is showing you um, all the, there are 8,683 lakes that they, they, they classified in New York. But, you know, most of the time people aren't interested in the whole state. So we can go and we can filter this by prism. So I'm going to click on the APIF prism and it'll crunch that number down to a smaller number of uh, 2,400. And then you can go through and do those individual levels, layers of things. Um, so you could say like, okay, um, what's the risk of introduction? And so you can see there's kind of this, it's a little bit hard on this, a uh, lot of information on the, on the screen at once, but you can see like here, it's giving, showing them this, this is a distribution of all the scores. So the gray is a distribution of the state, the blue is what's in our Adirondack prism. And so I could say, okay, I wanna just see, and they range from a scale of zero to 4.6. So I could say, okay, I'm only interested in seeing um, the, the, from two and above. You know, is this for any species or one day selected? This is all lakes. This is all the species, everything. And so they're just saying, okay. So now it's taken and said, okay. And in this distribution, if I go to two at the distribution, so one point nine eight, um, that only pulls up three lakes in the Adirondacks that are at this really high lake. What's it? Lake George, Lake Champlain, and Great Sacagawea. You know, but you can then kind of you know, set your tolerance, you know, to a different, a lower level, and this thing will then pop up. So it's allowing you to say, okay, what's your risk tolerance? How how much do you want to go and look? And so now we've taken it from, you know, 2,400 lakes, and now it's only 279 lakes that are, are most likely to be invaded. So then say that's for all species, plants, organisms, and things kind of like a, that's looking at those big factors, boats coming in, road traffic, how close they are to other different things. You could say, now we could just do risk of establishment. So you can say, well, I'm really worried about uh, hydrilla. So then I will click on hydrilla and you'll see that out of those 279 lakes, it's now identified 120, 129 of them that are suitable um, for establishment. So now we've you know reduced this further down, and once again there's a there's a threshold on this. So like I now have it set for like medium and high, but I could just sit just say okay, I'm only interested in the high. What, what lakes are the highest? So here's our 28 lakes in the Adirondacks that are most likely not only have an AIS come there, but likely that if it came, hydrilla would likely establish there. So now I can 28 lakes I can manage. That's a, that's a list that I can do a project with. That's something I can work on, not, you know, 2,000 um, some lakes. Same way if you want to, you're interested about, um, you know, or, I mean, you can also do like multiple. So I'm interested in Starry Stonewort and, you know, you know, spiny, um, spiny water flea and, you know, rusty crayfish. So it'll just, you know, keep adding in um, these different ones and then you can actually go and lake on the lake, you know, and so Cranberry Lake pops up, its risk is a 70 percent, its impact would be a 99 percent, and, you know, gives us information about boat traffic, distance, the other things, so it provides you information uh, on this as the lake as a whole. So this, these are, looking at the landscape, are 6.6 .6 million acres, these are the lakes. So it's a pool for people, you have a region that you have to manage or something, you can go in here and you can select some of these different priorities, that you're interested in. Um, you can also do this. Um, the last one is potential impact of invasion. Um, and so then you can kind of, that's the last one to say, okay, if I only wanted to look at, you know, the lakes that were of the highest quality. So then I've taken this, you know, uh, you can see how it goes down there from uh, down to eight, you know, so 2,400, 279, then my risk at introduction. 121 are suitable for establishment of the species I've chosen, and I wanted only the highest quality one. So here's the eight, and if they got in there, they would be most impacted. So maybe we should put our limited resources into those eight, you know, ones or into this 121. So it's just a way to kind of prioritize when you have more than you could you could ever do. Any general quick questions about this this, this model or this project? It's online. We'll make sure we send out. Um, the link to everybody afterwards for it.
this might be a little too in the weed, but I was wondering about the risk of introduction, the risk factors, how they weighted those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, we'll, they have a great documentation on the web page. So some things uh, got more weight and some things got less weight in each of those categories. You can go through there. So yes, yeah, so they did a weighted uh, model to project for it. Brian, what is the name of the app? Uh, this is um, this is uh, this, this is I believe it's uh, it's an ArcGIS application that, that's that's running this, um, and so this is hosted by the New York Natural Heritage Program. So if we go there, we yeah, if you go to New York Natural Heritage Program, you can see on their projects. This is one of their projects, but we'll send out the link to this. This is invaluable. This is yeah. really cool. Pretty cool. And, and it's going to get cooler. <laughs> and it's across the state, so you know this works for. Um, all whatever region of New York you're in. Okay, so let me stop this share, and then now we'll you can go back and share the the PowerPoint again. Is it the this one here? No, you need to go to the Zoom. Go to Zoom. Put your screen on Zoom. And then the, this one right. This one right there. Okay, and now we're back. All right, so great tool, super useful to use. Okay, so now we know which lakes to prioritize. So we've taken that original shaker paper that we did. We use a lot of that information and modeling. We put it into an interactive web map so that anybody can interact with this and kind of see this. So we know on that landscape level, 6.6 .6 million acres, 12,600. Well, then actually, for us, it's only 2,000 uh, water bodies. Which ones are most likely? But so that tells me this picture of Scroon Lake. That tells me Scroon Lake is high, is as a higher risk than some of the other lakes to be invaded. But it doesn't tell me where in the 4,100 acres of Scroon Lake, I need to be looking in that needle for a haystack. So that's still an issue that, you know, okay, we know this lake is likely, but where in that lake that's over 4,000 acres should we look at? Um, so with our great work with um, our early detection team through the funding of uh, the New York DEC, we work with uh, Adirondack Research and for, uh, how many years? This is our fifth, sixth year we're going into? In our sixth year we've gone into, we've been collecting um, a lot of really high quality data on lakes. The, the depth, uh, the hardness of the, the substrate, where we are mapping, and then there's also other people who are mapping um, invasive species in IMAP. And then we also know about some of the, the human features, like where a boat launch is, and where a campground is, and where a, um, where a, a public beach is. And so our question was, can we build a model that uses data to predict where within a lake AIS plants are most likely to occur? Um, we had to use uh, aquatic invasive uh, plants because uh, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the organisms are a little bit more mobile. It's a little bit harder. Also, we have much better data quality on plants than we do on um, the invasive animals. Um, and so here's our hypothetical model. We are putting in this sonar-based data. We're putting in this human landscape um, feature data, and then we're putting in the AIS data where they are located into a model and saying, can that model then predict other areas that would be most likely to do this? So uh, we did an, an RFP out to select a consultant, and we selected TetraTech, a uh, really great group of people, Kateri, Brian, and Mark, data scientists based out in, in North Carolina, and they were really able to work with us to take our ideas and our data, data and, and use some really cool um, statistical models uh, to kind of make this come together. So um, our question is, you know, can we predict AIS plant presence within a lake using spatial, spatial data sets? And so we're using things like the sonar data, we're using the AIS data, the plant presence, absence, where it's been mapped, um, human things like boat launches, campgrounds, marinas, um, surfaces, using land cover data from the, the National Land Cover Database about forests and impervious surface and agriculture. And they built three models 
to test the prediction. So um, they're kind of like scaling up in complexity. They did a linear model that was called a lasso model. They did an artificial neural network model. And then they did a tree-based machine learning model that's called XGBoost. And this is um, these are pretty advanced uh, statistical models that I know like just like an inch about. So it's really good to have them um, bring their expertise to. So to kind of like help you conceptualize like how this actually works is um, we break the landscape into 10 by 10 meter grids, we call it a pixel. And um, we, let's see, we know each of these little things that are on there. So every pixel gets scores for every single variable. So um, there's no AIS in this one. It's got a depth of one meter. It's uh, you know five meters from the shore. It's 10 meters from the nearest forest and 10% of the focal area is impervious surface. And then this pixel that we know has an invasive because we already went out there and mapped it. It has invasive, it's two meters deep. We do this for hundreds of thousands of pixels to see if we can figure out is there any you know, data um, correlation for And then we can use that, that model to then predict and kind of create like these heat maps of saying like, okay, this area doesn't seem very suitable for AIS. This one's like a medium suitability. And then this one is a high one and this one's a high one and it already has it uh, in there. Um, so we, from the 166 lakes we've done over the years, we had to take a group that had invasive species on them and then model it out. So we trained the model on 33 lakes, that's 53,000 individual pixels. And then we tested it on nine lakes of 19,000. So here's the um, purple is train and uh, orange is test right there. Um, and so we, we started to get results and we started to work with them to refine the models and go through there. So um, this is a little bit, might be hard for everybody to see, but um, this is Chazy Lake. And so um, an example of a good predict, a, a bad prediction would be, um, you know, this area right over here, they predicted to be kind of low for invasive species, but this little yellow, we already went out there and mapped there. So um, the model predicted a low place where we actually know it was in, so that's bad. Um, but then this is good. So this like yellow on top of the, the colored blob is this is where it's saying, oh, it predicted the invasive species to be there and we know it's there because we already went out and mapped it. So that's uh, like, like where the model is working good. So then we can then score these models to try to choose which is the most accurate and has the best characteristics for us to use. Um, so there's a lot to kind of take in. And so um, we'll basically kind of show you um, the results. If you kind of just want to look at the end kind of summaries right here, this is first the accuracy of each model. So the linear model was about 54% accurate when we do all of this different data on this. Um, the neural network was only about 44%. So these ones are, this one's less than a coin flip. This one's slightly better than a coin flip, so not too good. Um, then using these, uh, machine, the tree-based machine level learning, we got um, two different models that were that we felt were the, the top two. And um, the, the one that had the best overall subset was about 75% accurate in its predictions. And then the second one that had a different subset without five volume was around 71% accurate um, for the predictions. And so this is um, the model results. So we dumped in hundreds of variables into this model and it's doing this tree branching things where it's looking at each model and selectively making iterations to choose the best group of parameters to use. So it comes down to four parameters in each one of these models. And the best subset, it was the area of the biovolume, so the height of plants in the water around it was the number one factor. It's distance, the shoreline, the distance, the forest, and then the, it's distance from non-zero uh, plant growth in there. So that was the best that had 75%. And then the best without biovolume, um, it was distance to shoreline, distance to forest. Uh, how much impervious area is in the zone around it? And then how much agriculture is in the area um, around it? So these were kind of interesting things. And if you kind of think back to some of like the landscape level stuff, talking about distance to I-87, distance to roads. You see that some of these, these are similar things that kind of uh, are showing some similar patterns. Um, so this is called a confusion matrix. And basically this is saying, okay, 
we how what percentage of time was it correct? So in this best subset, the model predicted 33% of the time where we observed AIS. So in from this quadrant, it was 33% correct. Um, and so when you compare them, um, the model without bio volume actually did slightly better, even though the overall model accuracy was a little bit lower, it did better at predicting presence where we observed presence. And it also did better at predicting uh, and fewer false negatives. So where the model predicted an absence, 15% of the time there actually was AIS there. This other model, it was slightly higher, it was 17%. So based on these kind of results and that the overall accuracy was similar, we selected this XG boost without bio volume because it had some characteristics. It's better at finding the positives, which we want, and it had less false negatives. Um, and with using the bio volume data, we only have bio volume data on 166 lakes. So we could then only use this model to predict on 166 lakes until we would have to go out and collect more data, which takes time and takes money to go out and you know get these sonar readings from them. But if we chose the model without the bio volume data, we can predict on thousands of lakes because it's a national data set that is for across New York and across um, the country. So based on these two things, we said, okay, we're gonna go with, with um, we're gonna go with, with this one. And so, ta-da, uh, we will stop. We have a, a draft, this will go live um, next month. So if you can stop sharing here, I will give a quick review. Yeah, I can have over also. Okay. Um, so like I said, right now, um, there's a draft. We're still kind of working on this. Um, we also, so we decided because we could do this on a, we could, technically could do it on a state. We could do this on a national level, actually, because we're using national data sources. Um, but you know, it's been built on data from the Adirondack, so we didn't want to extend too far. So we use the same 10 mile buffer that we have for our, um, our AIS boat, um, oh, why am I blanking on the thing? Certification law. So we have a certification law that says all boats within 10 miles going to water within 10 miles. So we use that same boundary because that's a kind of important kind of boundary for us. So we did it outside of our um, Adirondack them also even into uh, Vermont and so um, eventually you'll be able to see every single lake on here um, predicted but right now we're just kind of showing the lakes that we tested and trained so um, let me zoom in to this should be um, I think it's Frank Union Falls so now you're taking this really big lake of Union Falls and it's uh, starting to predict areas in here that are more likely to be invaded. And you can use um, this filter on the top. Right now it's filtering from, the prediction is from 50 to, to 100. And so, you know, this is still a fair amount of area, you know, on here that it is predicting. So, you know, you say, hey, I'm only really interested in, you know, what the model predicts is like the top, you know, 65 or 70 um, percent. You can filter this down and, you know, it's kind of shrunk it down now to, you know, kind of some more, um, you know, manageable kind of areas in here. And you can even go into the layers and we can turn on our IMAP invasive data. And so you can see that these are areas that we've mapped. You know, and you can see like right around here, like the model did a pretty good job of saying like, okay, this is an area where we're predicting and kind of having an overlap um, over on the other side of this lake. It's kind of done pretty good um, predictions with this. And then there's other areas that, you know, uh, I mean, well, there are AIS there. And so, you know, this allows you to kind of look at it and say, okay, for this thousands and thousands of acres, you know, we need to prioritize kind of looking in this bay and maybe like this eastern shore um, kind of here. Um, and so, so yeah, so this will be something that will be available in the next month for um, all sorts of lakes. So like here, let's go, and, let's go into Kathy's Lake because she's here, you know? 
So, you know, here's, here's our Chat again. You know, so here's a big AIS polygon that was mapped, you know, and you can see like in this area, it's kind of like a little delta, like the model's predicting a pretty high level. Now, one of the things that is interesting for some of this is that, um, you know, it, the, the distance to shoreline kind of came in, uh, different things. So like, um, you know, one of the things that we found out from this is that the data that we have within a lake is very small. You know, we don't have a good depth on a lot of different things and different stuff. So like, it assumes, the model assumes like, okay, this is too far away from the shore. Like this is gonna be too deep, but this is a shallow area of the lake. And so you can see like the actual bed goes much further out, but the model, you know, because of just the general parameters, it doesn't predict that. So, you know, it's not perfect. I'll be the first one to, you know, to say that, that it's not perfect, but it, it's been pretty impressive when you kind of start, let's see, when you start to go in here and, you know, kind of like explore around on this, where it'll kind of identify areas and places, um, you know, to kind of look at. So hopefully this will be a tool that allows you to, you know, go in and, you um, You'll be able to look at thousands of lakes across the Adirondacks. You'll be able to choose your own lake, and it'll help you say, okay, if we have limited time or we have limited amount of um, sampling we can do, what should be the areas within a lake that I should really focus on? All right, and um, that is that. That is it. That was everything that that, that I have here. Um, I don't know if I have right at 11 or two, so. I think, well, you know, that's a lot of data to absorb, but let's take a couple of minutes. If you have questions about what Brian's just presented, you have some quick questions, let's get Brian to answer it now. He's also available, um, you know, by phone and yeah. we'll have the model up available soon. We got- we have Aaron's a got a question. Aaron, okay. Aaron, Aaron, go ahead. Aaron. come on. You're, you were here <laughs> the for this, right? Aaron's yeah. the reason we did this. It's, probably. it's yeah, it's a really exciting um, tool. I'm I'm excited to look at it. I was curious, do you have plans to kind of set, like test it in the, the future years in the summer? Um, yeah, definitely. So we're definitely going to want to, you know, now that we'll, we'll have this available, um, you know, we're going to be looking for feedback on it. So we're going to, our, our, our staff, you know, the early detection team, you know, we're going to be going out and we'll have access. And so like, we're going to be looking in these areas. Now, one of the things that, you know, a caveat I'll say about it is um, overall, all the models kind of confirm something that in our lakes, places that are good for aquatic plant growth are generally probably good for also invasive plants in them. And so um, just because a plant isn't there doesn't mean it's not good habitat for it. You know, so the model will probably can still predict these areas that are, um, you know, likely to have it. But, um, you know, most of our lakes are not invaded. They don't have it. So you won't see it in there. Um, it's just kind of hopefully what it allows people to do is, hey, out of these 4,000 acres or 100 acres or however big your lake is, there's a couple spots that when you go out to as a volunteer, as a professional, focus a little bit more on this one. Do an extra rake toss in that one. Grab an extra each and a sample from that area because the model says you're more likely to find it. And if we find it early, then we can manage it better. We do have a comment from Neil in the chat. Um, going back to when you were talking about bio-based, I believe he said Screen Lake was completely mapped and new areas and bases were found, and that work started with Gabe himself. Awesome, yeah. Still, I mean, the model that came out best, best for like overall accuracy was using bio volume. So I do think it is a, um, a, a it can be a useful uh, tool to use. Um, there are just like some, you know, nuts and bolts logistics to it, and then. You know, when we have, you know, we only have data on around 100, actually a little bit less than 200 lakes, you know, where now we can do this across thousands of lakes and across, you know, state if, kind of if we needed to. Brian, is it fair to say from some of that data <laughs> that the closer you are to a forested shore, the least, the less likely you are to have AIS there? Yeah. Um, so some of the data, there's some interesting stuff, and, you know, there's, there's going to be a full report on our website coming out soon, so you can kind of tease apart some of these things. But a lot of it was kind of uh, validating these things that we were just gut telling people, like, you know, if you protect the shoreline, um, if you're further away from development, if you're further away from, um, you know, impervious surfaces like man-made, you know, um, it you're less likely to have some of these in, in, invasives on, on there. 
Um, how do lake associations who really don't have the expertise in understanding all of this, how are we to come together in some way and, and find somebody to help us evaluate what all of these sites are now? <laughs> Yeah, well, that's me. I'll be, I will definitely be one of those people. So, you know, really, I think how it'll be implemented is, you know, you'll, you know, you'll look at your lake and then you can work with me or, or another lake professional. And, you know, we can look at these data and say like, okay, overall says that Chattagay Lake has this level of risk for these species. And then these are the areas that, you know, you should probably prioritize for looking for that early detection um, because, you know, even our lakes that are invaded with things like Eurasian water milfoil, other different stuff, we don't want other things coming there. You know, we don't want hydrilla, we don't want, you know, uh, Asian clam or other stuff going through. So, um, you know, prioritizing early detection is, is still the key. So this is going to come up with like a recommendation plan, basically, for a lake where you could say, okay, you can, you can now organize other teams to go out, let's say, specifically looking for something like hydrilla, because the following bays in your lake might be the spot yep. where the, that um, Yeah, exactly. Yeah, another another thing that can be useful for, we're doing this with Long Lake, we're doing multi-year surveys for them, but two years ago, we're just focusing on those areas where they've had no foil and they've created it, and then every three years, we're doing the entire lake. So it allows us to be much more efficient, spread stuff over a longer period of time to make it more cost-effective. Yeah. Well, thank you, Brian. Um, pretty amazing stuff, and just delighted to have the help of Rock folks here. Yeah. Um, and so now we're just going to go to a completely different ecosystem out of the water and onto the land and figure out about light state and what the alternatives are for Nazi. All right, let me make sure. Are you got to say that? If you want to I'm switching. Give me a quick challenge. Do you want to watch? Do you want to know where you're at? That'd be great. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, I was looking around the room as everyone else was speaking, and I do see a lot of familiar faces, but some new ones as well. It's so nice to be back in person with everyone. This is our first time since COVID. So, hello. I'm Zach Simic. I'm our conservation GIS analyst. I work with uh, both the Adirondack and St. Lawrence Eastern Lake Ontario Prisms. For those of you who have, who have been around a while, you probably remember me as our terrestrial coordinator. So I got to deal with um, not lead a law in a prior role before Becca joined our team. Um, and what I'm gonna be talking about today is a research project we started last field season, which is looking at treatment alternatives for not lead, so invasive not lead. Um, oh, I'm the wrong screen. <laughs> So, okay, I don't think we need to spend too much time talking about what Notweed is. Who doesn't Who doesn't know Notweed? Anybody? All right, so we're all familiar with it. <laughs> Large herbaceous shrub, grows over 12 feet tall, grows very quickly, it spreads clonally, it spreads by fragmentation. Once it's established, really difficult to control and eradicate. Um, it's widespread in New York State. Um, this is data from IMAP invasives. All of those green points represent an infestation of uh, Japanese knotweed that's been reported. You can see it's pretty much ubiquitous across the entire state, including the Adirondacks. Um, but for us, this is a species that we manage pretty frequently. Although it is widespread, it is one that has high impact. So it's a species we choose to control in areas where it could impact natural resources that we care about. So as far as species that APIP manages, it's number three as far as the most common, one of the most common ones that we control. Um, and in the partner dashboard survey that we distributed, it was the second most common species that our partners are working on as well. So one that is certainly of interest to our region. Um, the current best management practice to control knotweed is the application of a glyphosate-based herbicide. The two most common treatment techniques that are used are foliar spray featured here, applying a diluted solution of herbicide to the plant's leaves. Um, and we also use direct stem injection. So with a specialized tool, injecting a small amount of concentrated herbicide into those hollow stems of the plant. The challenge that we're beginning to face is that uh, glyphosate, it could, it could benefit from a publicist. So glyphosate <laughs> has received a lot of negative attention um, in the media and even in some scientific working circles. 
Um, and it all began in 2015 when the Inter International Agency for Research on Cancer listed glyphosate as a category 2A probable carcinogen. Um, after that, we saw a lot of uh, you know, media attention. There were some high profile court cases where people who use glyphosate sued the manufacturer, won these uh, mega million size lottery payouts um, from those court cases. And this is beginning to kind of touch down in New York State where now we have legislation that limits the use of glyphosate on state-owned properties. Thankfully, um, there are exemptions in that legislation that still allow us to use this tool to control invasive species. Um, but when you look at the big picture, I think we can perhaps agree that the writing is on the wall, that this tool may in the future no longer be available for us to control um, this species and others. So that begs the question, if glyphosate, the current best management practice for this species is removed from our toolbox, what are we going to use? Um, and that is the whole focus of this research project. So to address this question, we established research plots in three locations throughout the Adirondacks. We selected three established, previously untreated infestations of knotweed that were pretty large in size. And within them, we set up these little small one square meter plots. You can kind of see an example of one of our research layouts here where that orange polygon represents an obvious infestation and those smaller squares represent our research plots. Um, so we were evaluating a couple of different chemical active ingredients as well as a few um, application techniques. So we were evaluating both foliar spray that applying the solution of herbicide to the leaves and direct injection. So we laid out our plots, we had these foliar spray plots on the edge of the infestation and then some injection and control plots within the interior of the site. Um, we randomly assigned the treatments to these different plots. We performed our treatments near the peak growth and flowering period of knotweed around August, September. And then we performed follow-up monitoring two, four, and six weeks after treatment to see how effective each product and application technique was at controlling um, the knotweed stems. So we actually tracked individual stems within these plots over the course of six weeks to see how they declined um, and evaluated them with a visual survey. And then I, I won't talk too much about this today, um, but we did it, test one mechanical treatment technique that was installing um, wire mesh, um, a wire mesh application on the ground. I'll show a photo of that in a second. Uh, we, we applied that in August of 2022, and it was kind of too, too soon to really evaluate its impact last summer. So we'll follow up on that this year to see how it, how it turned out. Um, so what did we test? We used three herbicide active ingredients and two application techniques. So we tested the tried and true glyphosate in comparison to two other active ingredients, those being amazapir, which is often marketed under the trade name Arsenal, and aminopurulid, which is marketed under the trade name of Milestone. For both, we applied or we used two application techniques, that foliar spray and an injection, and we selected a application rate based on some existing best management practice documents and scientific literature. And you can see it varied for each of the products. Um, and again, here's just an example of that wire mesh application which we're testing. Basically involves cutting down the knotweed stems, applying this wire mesh ground, as the stems grow through, the idea is that that wire mesh girdles the stems and prevents them from being able to grow. Won't be presenting results on this, but we'll be speaking specifically about um, the chemical application work that we did last summer. All right, so let's let's look at results. This is a busy graph, but we'll break it down. On our x-axis here, all of our different treatments that we apply. We have our control, our three foliar treatments, and our three injection treatments, and the different colored bars represent. Um, our monitoring periods. So two, four, and six weeks after our treatment. And then on the uh, vertical or the y-axis is the average percent injury of stems within plots for each of those treatment techniques, so averaged across all sites. So what are some of the general trends that we observe here? Well, over the monitoring periods, um, the percent injury increased over time. That's what we would expect. Uh, as time after the application increases, we see more mortality or damage to the stems at those sites. Generally speaking, our injection sites resulted in greater injury or um, damage than foliar sites. And of course, all of those were greater than our untreated controls. Um, but to drill down as the overall impact, let's just remove some of the noise and look at just six weeks after treatment. So what do we see here? Let's compare against our tried and true general best management practice glyphosate. 
Looking at our injection sites, we found that um, the aminopurulate was basically the same level of control observed as glyphosate. And when we look at this statistically, there was no significant difference between any of those injection treatments. So all three products were equally as effective. Um, looking specifically at the foliar spray treatment plots, we found that there was a significant difference between glyphosate and amazapyr, where glyphosate outperformed the amazapyr. And similarly, there was a significant difference between glyphosate and aminopyrrolid, where aminopyrrolid outperformed the glyphosate. So what are our general takeaways from this data? Well, it suggests that should we lose glyphosate as an application uh, or as an active ingredient, we do have some potential viable alternatives that we can use in its place. Um, perhaps the most um, promising being that aminopyrrolid are, in other words, milestone. Um, just some notes as I, as I wrap up. Um, first and foremost, keep in mind that we were testing these applications on these specific little individual plots. We were not treating entire knotweed infestations, so there are definitely some um, nuances that we're probably not capturing um, as a result of that, and we might expect the results to be a little bit different if they were applied to a full infestation. This is, of course, only one year of treatment. No one treats knotweed one year and it's gone, um, so we need to think about the multi-year you know, process here, and we'll be going back out this spring to uh, reassess our plots and do additional treatments. Um, I want to acknowledge that the visual estimates we use to um, assess percent injury or control are certainly subjective. Everyone you know, looks at things differently, um, and we tried to minimize that bias by using one observer throughout the experiment. Uh, we want to acknowledge that the site conditions may play a little bit of a role in, how, in what we're seeing, where um, a treatment may be more effective in one location versus another just based on the, you know, the growing conditions at that site, the not weighted stress. It may not respond to the treatment as well as it, as it would in other locations. Um, and we only focused on monitoring large stems within each of the plots. And we defined large as stems that were over 20 mill millimeters in diameter. Um, why did we do that? Well, for one reason, it was really hard to treat those smaller stems, particularly with injection. And we actually found during our monitoring that particularly within the interior of a knotweed infestation, a lot of those small stems sort of are self-controlled and they're basically shaded out by the, the larger um, knotweed canopy, so they kind of die on their own in the absence of treatment. Um, just some general observations. All three of the herbicides acted a little bit differently, um, and that also varied by the application technique used. We saw that the injection treatments generally responded in a much more dramatic fashion. They would decline faster, they would drop their leaves faster, um, where the decline in the foliar spray plots was a little bit more slow and gradual over time. Um, and very interestingly to me personally, after having treated Navi for a long time, we applied these treatments specifically to these one square meter plots. And we always talk about these herbicides as being systemic. In other words, they're taken up by the plant and translocated to its roots. However, we did not see decline in any stems immediately outside of our treatment plots. So injecting a stem within this one square meter plot, it did not affect any of the other nearby untreated stems, which just speaks to how um, durable this plant is and how um, careful we have to be to make sure when we treat it, our treatments are give, you know, full coverage. We're, we're treating every individual stem and plant. Um, so we'll be going back out this spring. We'll look at the plots. We'll see if we get any type of spring reemergence, which we would expect that we would, especially because there's untreated stems around our research plots. Um, and then we'll perform the same treatments in the same plots this um, summer and evaluate how they perform with the second year. All right. And you know, we're going to see how that mechanical treatment plot is looking. Hopefully it survived the winter. Short pause, and um, then I'm going to talk about HWA. Quick question. So the, the wire mesh, was it just a galvanized hardware cloth or was it something else? Yeah, so it's just a galvanized 19 gauge wire mesh um, installed with 12 inch landscape stakes um, spaced like every 18 inches throughout the mesh um, with the seams overlapping like a minimum of eight inches. Do the glyphosate alternatives cost a lot more? Um, in short, I guess yes. 
they do cost more, whether the cost difference is significant or not. No, it's certainly not 10 times more a huge difference. Yeah, the um, only thing that I didn't mention that I should is that our most viable, at least as our data suggests, our most viable alternative, this aminopyrrolid, is only available as a terrestrial formulation of herbicide. So glyphosate is available in both terrestrial and aquatic formulations, meaning we can apply it near or even in wetlands, whereas aminopyrrolid will be limited to applying it only in dry upland terrestrial sites. So not a perfect one-to-one -one replacement, but um, perhaps viable for some locations. Uh, How does that aminopyrrolid tax plan? <laughs> Uh, I don't know from memory the exact mode of action. It is different than glyphosate. And um, that was evident when we were doing the treatments and just how the plants responded. The aminopyrrolid seemed to brown up the plants a lot faster than glyphosate does. Um, so I'm curious to see when we return if um, longer term it's less effective because often when we see plants brown up quickly after treatment, that's a kind of a symptom of like top kill. So killing the above ground foliage, but not the yeah. below ground roots. How does it affect other plants around? It is a broad spectrum product, just like glyphosate or mazapir. So if they're off target, you know, drift or, you know, off target spray, um, it will impact other, other things. Um, but it is a naturally, naturally based product. I think it's from like a chrysanthemum some other flower derivative um, product. Um, it was just recently approved in New York State, but it's been used in basically every other state in the U.S. for many years, and it is considered to be like a minimally toxic product. Is it restricted use? It is a restricted use product. Is it labeled for other plant species? That you're using? Um, it is labeled for other um, terrestrial invasive plants, and if it is one that we opted to use more, um, it's probably one that we would seek some supplemental labeling for. Does it bind to soil in a glyphosate? It is not considered to be super soil mobile, so yet, yeah, it does bind, but glyphosate is, of course, kind of a star binder, um, known not to move much, so it's hard to, it set the high bar for comparison. So for landowners who are interested in managing the knotweed on their own property, if you don't know, um, APIP does have a few stem injectors available for landowners to borrow. Um, and you can buy the glyphosate product um, basically commercially over the counter, if you will, and use the stem injector. So if you want to try some injection on your property, um, we can reach out to Becca Bernacki and we can get you lined up with uh, borrowing that stem injector. We usually make it available in Keene Valley. People can have it for a week, drop it off, um, and the next person gets it. And a lot of that treatment usually happens you know, around sort of mid-August to mid-September. Um, certainly you can do it a little bit earlier than that if you want as well. Uh, but you want to be able to do it a couple weeks before frost so that you are able to get it into the plant before frost hits. Um, any other questions on that before we move on? And unfortunately, she just stepped out, but I did want to acknowledge Megan, who was our forest pest research assistant last year. She helped a lot with this um, not we, um, experiment specifically the plot layout. Just one real quick one for you, not being super familiar with Nawi. Um, what is pretty standard for like stem count per square meter for in terms of like new injections? Yeah, I did I did calculate that and I've um, forgotten, but it was anywhere I believe from like 20 to 40 stems per square meter. From memory, it could be wrong, but somewhere around there. Yeah, I know that it's pretty high. Yeah. Sorry, I, have a, I have a quick comment. Um, just commending APIP for your work in shifting gears from glyphosate to something else. I think it's really unfortunate that treatment of invasive species have become so politicized, and this really sucks. So kudos to APIP for, for allowing partners like us to shift gears, you know, and and and, and the realization that yeah, glyphosate could. Disappear. Like that's a real option. So yeah, and I will just acknowledge that we still consider glyphosate to be a very important tool in our toolbox, and we'll be continuing to use it as long as it is a viable tool for us. But um, 
yeah, it is unfortunate that it could potentially go away. All right, so um, yeah. in a quick five minutes, I'm just going to provide a very quick update on hemlock weed adelgid. I know that this is a species of interest to many people in the partnership, um, and our understanding of hemlock weed adelgid has changed quite a bit over the last couple of years. So I just wanted to highlight some of the new things that we've learned, specifically its, it's distribution within our region. Uh, so quick flying through, what is it? Well, it's an aphid, it's small, it's woolly, it's on the underside of hemlock branches. <laughs> Where is it? Um, it's pretty ubiquitous across a good portion of New York State, but here in the Adirondacks, it's sort of just making its inroads. Um, and within the Adirondack prism, it's restricted to the Lake George watershed, where it was first found in 2017 on Prospect Mountain. This particular infestation was promptly treated um, in, co in coordination between APIP and DEC and later deemed to be locally eradicated. And we took a little break and um, 10 to 20 points. <laughs> Um, a vigilant camper at the Glen Islands campground on Lake George on the Eastern Shore found a new, new infestation of HWA that turned out to be quite established. And follow-up surveys throughout that year identified additional infestations on a couple of private land sites at the Buck Mountain Trailhead and Shelving Rock area, and later on uh, the Nature Conservancy's Dome Island. Thanks, Alex, for your help with that one. Um, surveys continued through the years, um, 2021, that infestation near Glen Island continued to expand northward in 2022, another banner year. Um, so as the, as the populations expand, but also we're looking more, we find more. Um, so some additional sites on the western shore, Hearthstone Campground, um, thanks to Forest Pest Hunter, confirmed, uh, doesn't show up. Confirmed uh, north of the Tongue Island Peninsula, we had some island finds at Mohican and Turtle, um, Long Island in the center of the lake, Megan and I found. So continuing to expand, and then even still this year, we've already got some new findings. Oops, oops. Um, so 2023, another occurrence near that original Prospect Mountain find, so Big Hollow Brook down here in the southwestern corner of the lake. Um, more forest pest hunter finds, watch points, filling in this, this infestation, this known invaded area, and then most recently some private land um, in the northern portion of the lake. So what do we know? Well, we know H.W. Grace here, it's established within the watershed, and it's something that we're, we're going to have to live with in our region moving forward. Um, and I did just want to highlight that some management work has occurred within the watershed. These sites highlighted in blue are areas where some level of management has occurred that's primarily chemical control. None of these infestations have been treated in their entirety, except perhaps for Prospect Mountain. Um, but there has been some limited control done within the region and some biocontrols have been released. But this is a pest that will be on our landscape basically in perpetuity or in perpetuity. And lastly, I wanted to wrap up just by sharing a um, brief highlight from a project we worked on last field season in collaboration with the New York State Hemlock Initiative at Cornell University, where we used eDNA as a novel survey tool to look for hemlock weed adelgid. We know it's a small pest, it's really tiny, it's hard to see. And particularly when it's in low abundance, it can be hard to, to find. So we wanted to see if eDNA could be a potential solution to help us detect this insect earlier. So what we did is we selected a handful of survey sites in the southeastern portion of the prism that were at various distances from known occurrences of HWA. So we had them as close as one mile or less and all the way up to maybe four miles from known HWA. We also threw in some negative control sites, these pink squares where we did not expect to find HWA and some positive control sites where we knew that there definitely was HWA just to make sure that the survey technique and the laboratory analysis worked. So we collected these work samples in June by clipping little twigs off of trees. We sent those to the lab. Those, those twig tips were then kind of washed in a water solution, filtered, and then run through quantitative PCR to look for the presence of hemlock weed adelgid DNA. Um, what did we find? Interestingly, we got 11 positive results from this survey, which are circled here in the red. And some notable findings are what I personally found notable at the time. 
Number one up in the top right, that was um, Narrows Island, which was further north than we expected to find it in this survey. That was our um, our furthest treatment distance. So that in that that finding was at least four miles from known HWA. Um, we could not see it visually in the field when we collected the sample. Um, two here, this is the Buck Mountain Trailhead. So we sampled along a perpendicular transect moving away from the lake. And we found it as many as, as far as four miles inland from where it was known to occur. Again, we could not visually see HWA at any of these sites. Um, and then perhaps most surprisingly, two of what are, we would consider our negative controls, like, oh, we're never going to find HWA here. Well, both of those came up positive. That was um, Lazerne Campground number three. And number four was a little piece of forest preserved property near Great Sakandaga Lake. And then lastly, number five down there, this was several positives surrounding um, Rockwood State Forest, which was a known HWA site from 2018. Um, but HWA hadn't been observed since, um, at least visually. So it was an interesting exercise, and it highlighted the sensitivity of eDNA as a survey tool relative to visual surveys. So we'll be going back out to these locations this summer to resample the same exact sites, analyze how much DNA is present so that we can get an idea of whether populations are increasing, decreasing, or remaining stable. Um, and Megan helped a lot with these samples last summer. And that is all for me. And I think we're going to transfer it to you. So I know we could talk, a lot of us could talk about HWA for a long time, and we have at many of our meetings. But because there are so many people tracking closely what happens in the Lake George watershed, I thought particularly that time series of maps that shows, you know, how far it has moved. And now this understanding that it is part of our landscape and will be part of our landscape really into the future. The challenge now becomes to think about what are the highest priority areas that will need to be monitored and treated. And so similar to what Brian was talking about earlier uh, with the need to prioritize where within a lake, which lakes, where within a lake. Uh, we're currently having conversations with the EC, and I think there are some conversations happening also in the Lake George watershed about trying to do more of an analysis to figure out, well, what are the most important resources to protect water quality, to protect stream water temperature? Where are they? Where can we begin to prioritize our survey efforts for Hemlock Willia Delegate? And then, and where can we prioritize the treatment efforts? Because now, as you can see from those maps, it is really throughout the watershed. And so we're gonna have to move to that prioritization model, which doesn't exist yet, um, but that will be more to come. So I am going to um, introduce Molly in just a minute. Actually, let's see, somebody wanna introduce Molly? Uh, there she is. There we go. I'm going to introduce Molly, and I have to make Molly a co-host, I think, so she can share her screen. Great. I do want to make Molly a co-host. Perfect. Molly is there on the screen. For those of you who don't know Molly Hassett, Molly works for the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, and she used to work on the invasives team and then switched over to the climate team. So some of you are familiar with New York's uh, Climate Act. It is one of the strongest climate laws in the country. And if you're not aware of it, Molly will give a bit of an introduction to it. If you are aware of it, you know that as this act rolls out, fundamentally the way we do business in New York State and you know our, the way we heat our buildings, the way we travel around the state, all of that will be changing over the next 25 to 40 years as we begin to implement and hit the targets in the climate law. There are parts of the climate law that are particularly relevant to invasive species. And so I really want to thank Molly for joining us today to give us a bit of an overview of the act and to have us start thinking about how that uh, how our invasive species work not only helps our ecosystems here in the Adirondacks, but how that can help New York State meet its climate goals. So with that, thanks, Molly. I'm turning it over to you. All right. Thank you so much. Um, just want to double check sound. Sounds great. Great. Excellent. All right. So thank you so much for that introduction. And uh, I guess we'll dive right in here. <laughs> Advance. There we go. All right. So here's an overview of some of the things I wanted to touch on today. I wanted to start with talking about the climate 
uh, the carbon cycle and some of the definitions involved with the carbon cycle, just so we're all on the same page and talking the same language here. And then I wanted to kind of talk about why there's been so much focus on forests and landscape trends and how invasive species really play into the landscape trends, as well as then talk about the Climate Act and some of the very specific invasive species strategies that are listed in there. And then end just talking more broadly about invasive species and climate change and vulnerability and resilience, as well as hopefully ending on a somewhat positive note with opportunities. Yeah. All right, so talking about the carbon cycle, so there's lots of carbon dioxide in the air in the atmosphere, and carbon dioxide is really good at trapping heat, which causes a greenhouse effect in our atmosphere. Typically, that's a good thing because it means that our Earth stays heated and we can survive on the planet, and it doesn't get really, really, really cold at night or in the winter. Um, but of course, humans have been releasing a lot more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere since the industrialization period about 200 years ago or so. So there's more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere now. So trees, trees and ecosystems, plants, sequester carbon. They pull it from the atmosphere and take it into their plant tissues. And phytoplankton do this as well inside lakes. And as that carbon is sequestered by the trees or other plants, it becomes stored inside the ecosystem. So once it's stored in the ecosystem, it typically remains there for a while. It can move around into other storage pools like litter. So, you know, trees, they drop their needles, they drop their leaves or into the soils themselves, sometimes through mycorrhizae associations, the carbon can go directly into the soil. So it, it moves around a little bit. And that store carbon can then be released through decay and fires. It can be released through land conversion if all the trees are harvested, and then that area doesn't convert back to a forest. And some of that carbon dioxide will go directly back into the atmosphere. And other carbon might be stored for a longer period of time, like if some of the stored carbon might go into wood products, let's say. That wood can hold that carbon for a long period of time. So these carbon dynamics, they really vary over time, and they also vary a lot over space. Land use impacts the different amounts of sequestration and storage that's going on inside these ecosystems. And yeah, over time, of course, our forests, our ecosystems are changing. You've got succession going on. Some forests are becoming older. Some are being impacted by hemlock adelgid. There's lots of things going on that can impact these things. So what does this look like on the landscape? I want to talk about why there's been so much focus on forests. Well, as far as sequestration, that uptake from the atmosphere, forests sequester the highest amount of carbon per acre out of all the different types of ecosystems. And forests are also really important for carbon storage as well. So wetlands actually hold more carbon per acre than forests do, but forests also hold a high amount of carbon per acre compared to, say, grasslands or croplands, and especially compared compared to developed lands, which really don't hold that much carbon per acre. So as far as where carbon is stored inside an ecosystem, the majority of uh, forest carbon is stored inside the soil. And that's about 50% of the carbon inside our forests. About 30% is stored inside the tree trunk, branches and leaves above ground. And then the rest is stored inside the tree's roots, in fallen leaves and litter, and as well as in dead wood. So this is just a diagram to kind of represent some of the different things we might see over time with forest carbon. So forests, as they're growing, they'll take in more carbon from the air, more carbon dioxide, and store it inside their tissues. You might see carbon released through fire, through decomposition, storm events, um, invasive species, forest pests, for sure. And then if a forest is able to regenerate again, 
you'll see more carbon uptake and storage again. So it, it does fluctuate over time naturally. And this is just kind of showing spatially. You might have some patches of forest that have fewer trees or open gaps that have less carbon stored at least above ground. And then you might have really dense, heavily forested areas that have more carbon. But overall across the landscape, um, it kind of evens out to an extent within forests. I wanted to talk about the difference between storage and sequestration over time as well. So that diagram on the left has carbon storage by forest age. So if you look at that dotted total line, um, forests, when they're very young, do store carbon mostly in the soil, and they'll accumulate carbon slowly over time. And they'll continue to accumulate carbon typically, even into an old age. And older forests typically have more carbon stored per acre than, say, younger forests, because they've had more time to accumulate it. So looking at that diagram on the right-hand side of the screen, that one's talking about carbon flux, where the negative values are actually carbon sequestration. So overall, younger forests sequester more carbon than older forests, and sequestration peaks around 15 to 30 years of age for forests, and then slowly declines with older forests having less carbon sequestration over time. Because older forests also have, um, there's a lot more competition as trees grow in, and um, I guess the growth rate slows over time as a lot of that um, a lot of the resources are taken up by all the various different trees. So talking about climate change mitigation, it's about the balance between uptake or sequestration and release, which is carbon emissions. So in New York State, a lot of the carbon sequestration is taking place inside our forests as well as our wetlands. And what we're balancing, I guess, through the Climate Act is comparing how much carbon sequestration is occurring inside our forests and balancing with that how much uh, carbon emissions is being released by all of our cars, all of our buildings, and other sectors. So the sequestration trends in New York have been decreasing, and this is largely driven by forests. You see the green line on the top of that chart has been slowly declining over the past 30 years. We think a lot of that is due to just a really slow loss of forest land, as well as aging forests, since older forests tend to sequester carbon slower, as well as uh, forest pests and invasive species. So Brendan, I think, worked with APIP several years ago. Uh, he actually went to Cornell and studied climate change and invasive species as well. And he found that forest pests and diseases decrease sequestration in forests. Um, if there's a forest pest inside a forest, they find within an area it's about a 69% decrease in sequestration. And if there's an, a disease inside a forest area, there's, it relates to about a 28% decrease in forest carbon sequestration. And of course, uh, part of that is forest pests and diseases also increase carbon emissions. So as trees die, as they grow more slowly, they might be emitting carbon into the atmosphere, decay and other events potentially. In addition to that, invasive plants can prevent forest regeneration, which really prevents the forest from gaining more carbon since trees are really the best at pulling that carbon from the atmosphere. And there might be other alterations as well related to wildfire risk and soil carbon, depending on where you are and what's going on inside the forest. So New York State now has this Climate Act and the scoping plan for the Climate Act was actually just finalized in December of last year. So the Climate Act established a Climate Action Council that developed a scoping plan to meet certain targets. Um, 
These targets included 70% renewable energy by 2030, 100% zero emissions from electricity generation by 2040, and an 85% reduction in greenhouse gas levels from 1990 levels by 2050. So, this part at the bottom, though, is really important for forests and other natural and working lands, which is a goal of 100% net zero emissions by 2050. So that, again, is kind of looking at that balance again. It's looking at that sequestration from forests and our other lands to cancel out those remaining greenhouse gases that are released from other sectors, which will be about 15% potentially. So what that looks like, our current sequestration in New York is about 27.7 million metric tons of carbon dioxide, and most of that is coming from forests. A little bit of that is occurring in wood products, and right now that's equal to about 7% of New York State's other emissions from other sectors like cars, transportation, uh, buildings, heat. So. The goal of net zero is actually 60 million metric tons of carbon dioxide sequestration by 2050, which is definitely highly ambitious. So there were some strategies developed from a advisory panel for the Climate Action Council, and some of these included prioritizing locations for natural resource protection, management and restoration, keeping forests as forests, afforestation, reforestation, so really just tree planting and encouraging trees to grow, preventing and controlling forest pests, diseases, and invasive species, promoting restoration, and supporting forest landowners and municipalities. So some of the very specific invasive species strategies that were inside the scoping plan include increasing prevention of invasive species through strengthened regulations, inspections, and enforcement of wood packaging materials and live plant imports, expanding DEC's statutory authority to allow more rapid listing of invasive species for regulation, Part 575. And that piece, I just wanted to add that right now the legislature has to be involved. So it's not that, um, like, a lot of the councils that we have, like the Invasive Species Council, wouldn't be involved because that's not what they're going for at all, I don't believe. It's more that the legislature wouldn't need to have so many levels of approval. Um, the next strategy is increasing capacity for prevention and rapid response teams for forest pests and disease outbreaks and invasive vegetation, especially those that negatively impact forest carbon. And there are some additional related strategies as well, not directly, as directly involved with invasive species, but of course, implementing restoration efforts and degraded forests to improve carbon storage, sequestration, carbon resilience can be tied to invasive species restoration and establishing trees on potentially 1.7 million acres could be tied as well to those restoration efforts. So as we move forward, it's also important to think about the future mitigation potential of our forests. So thinking about climate vulnerability and the landscape resilience, because we want our forests to continue to sequester carbon for us into the future. So thinking about future losses that might be expected in productivity or gains in productivity, as well as regeneration from climate change and other impacts. Um, we expect that restoration will probably become more difficult with climate change because there will be hotter, drier summers, as well as just hotter temperatures overall, which seedlings don't really prefer when you put them in the ground. Um, as well as when you're thinking about the landscape overall, encouraging a diversity and connectivity and vigor and function to promote climate change and other resilience will be really important. So some future climate impacts we might be seeing from invasive species and forest pests might include range expansion and increased success of invasive species and forest pests and diseases. Um, of course, I have the picture of southern pine beetle, but of course, as um, Zach was just talking about, you've got hemlock willy adelgid, which might 
be expanding further into the Adirondacks, potentially. You also have to think about warm water aquatic species, which might have more success as waters warm in the future. There might also be some lower success for existing invasive species, such as invasive earthworms might suffer from droughty conditions that occur. Um, native plants and trees might also become more stressed by climate change, depending on what species they are. So that might open them up to further invasion for forest pests and diseases. Um, there also will probably be more disturbance from extreme weather events like flooding, as well as windstorms. And I already talked a little bit about lower regeneration and planting success. That's mainly due to potentially higher deer populations surviving the winter better, as well as the hotter temperatures that regeneration and young trees might die more quickly from, and potentially a lack in phenology between pollinators and different plant species. So some management considerations as well is that there might be higher impacts to native ecosystems, especially those stressed trees and plants. Um, some invasive plant and other species might become more competitive in a warmer environment. And especially for lots of invasive plants, I know you guys were just talking about glyphosate, but herbicide and other management techniques may change or become less effective on certain plants. There have been some studies to show that for some species. I'm not sure about knotweed specifically. Um, restoration may become more difficult with planting seedlings. Um, it's probably important to continue to focus on prevention as that tends to be the best option for invasive species overall, wherever you are in any conditions. And I already said, considering ecosystem resiliency will be really important. Trying to end on a positive note, there are potentially some opportunities out there. Um, I feel like climate change is really starting to call more attention, more focus for forestry related programs, as well as invasive species programs and issues. Um, I know the New York State Invasive Species Research Institute has been part of the climate assessment, so I feel like it is starting to pull some different groups together who might not talk to or work with each other very often. Um, there's also potential funding opportunities coming out, like the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, the Farm Bill, the New York State Bond Act, as well as EPS. So there is some hope. And that's my contact information. Questions or anything? Yeah, okay, I see one hand up here, Molly. We've got Tom um, Algar with a question. Molly, has there been any clarity on how the Climate Action Council and the Invasive Species Council are gonna interact? So I think the Climate Action Council has reached out about that. I, or the, Sorry, the Invasive Species Council. So I actually did talk to them a bit about that, or at least the advisory committee. And right now the Climate Action Council has kind of dispersed. It, so there, the Climate Action Council's only um, purpose, I guess, or goal was to create the scoping plan. And now they've created it, and I think they've dispersed again. In another five years or so, the scoping plan will be updated again, and I think that would be a good opportunity for maybe these two groups to connect. But at the moment, I don't know that there's really a space for the two to talk since one of them is dispersed. So for those who aren't uh, quite as familiar with what some of the, that conversation was about, um, there is a state um, invasive species council, and it really is representative of many of the state agencies in the state. Um, hopefully, that will be the venue where they'll be able to talk about um, how all of the agencies are integrating on climate. There also is an advisory committee to that state uh, council, and Becca Bernacki is the Nature Conservancy's representative on that. And Tom, you are on. Um, I, I am kind of the liaison, kind of like with Josh. 
for the advisory committee. Yes. And my director, Chris Loeb, is the co chair of the the council, right. which is nine state agencies. Yeah. So that's a good place, I hope, for some of the coordination yeah. to have. And I and I I'm not on the council, but I help Chris with it. <laughs> yeah. Are there other questions for Molly? Yep, I've got one in here in the rooms. Okay, Sue. Hi. Um, so I, I think there's something like 33 million acres of private forest land in the state of New York and 3 million acres or more of state farm land. What kind of plan does do we have to promote forest retention in these private owners since they're a big Right, so Molly, the question is about private forest landowners. If you have a couple talking points, um, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so private forest landowners, private forest land inside the state makes up about 74% of our forests. So they're really, really, really important. And holding on to those lands is also really important. Um, so some of the things that were suggested inside the scoping plan were potentially um, tax like a new tax law program that isn't as focused on harvesting, um, maybe a payment for ecosystem services program, as well as conservation easements and more land acquisition. Now, as far as which of those may or may not come into play when, we're just getting into implementing the scoping plan right now. So we're trying to figure some of those things out, but those are probably some of the bigger ones related to that inside the scoping plan. And there's certainly New York State has put a priority on trying to maintain forest land for a long time. There is um, an alternative tax law. I know, Sue, you're from Vermont, but sort of like the current use version in New York is 480A. And so landowners who own forest land, who agree to manage their forest land, can get a reduction in property taxes for that. Um, there are some landowners who are now also beginning to think about managing their land for carbon. And the Nature Conservancy has a family forest carbon program for landowners to aggregate to begin to think about how they might be able to monetize their carbon credits. Um, there are certainly state foresters available to help private landowners and a lot of consulting foresters around the state. As Molly said, though, you know, there is certainly a hope that some of these new federal funding sources in particular, and perhaps if New York generates new funding to support the implementation of the climate law, that there will be more opportunities for private landowners, uh, particularly in our world, to be managing for invasive species as well. Right. So now, Vermont this year in the legislature changed our current use plan so that you could have uh, no logging for timber. Before that, to have a, 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 a forestry plan, you had to log, but now you don't have to you choose to leave your forest as they are, maybe to an invasive, yes, invasive land removal or a pit, a certain pitting, but you don't have a requirement to log your land. I have another question. Um, we'll do, take one more question and then I'm going to do a wrap up, but we'll have a lot more time to stay on here because some folks have been tolerant on Zoom for a long time. Go ahead. Okay. So, wetlands apparently do a great deal for sequestering. Carbon. They also do a lot of other great things. What are we doing to preserve wetlands? And can we stop the practice of removing beaver dams and sending water and sediments into our lakes and streams as a practice to protect culprits? Right. So there, there's a whole lot of questions about wetlands, and I don't think we can get that far into wetlands regulation today. Uh, but we are fortunate that at the federal level, we do have wetlands protection, and that happens a lot through um, our Corps of Engineers. And New York State uh, also has wetland protections and, in fact, tightened up those wetlands protections last year. Um, as far as beaver dams, I'm not one to talk about how you get permits to remove beaver dams. Anybody here know about the permits to remove dams? I do know you're supposed to have one before you do it. <laughs> yeah, either. What? And they're not easy to get. So we're not willy-nilly removing beaver dams. But Well, apparently the road people can do it right. whenever they need to protect a culvert, which, you know, beavers see culverts as holes in dams. 
Yeah. Um, so I think the point about the wetlands and the point about the forest, um, and it ties into what we talked about, our lake vulnerability, the closer our lake shores are to forests, the less likely they are to be invaded by aquatic invasive species. Those forests are also helping us with our climate sequestration. Um, we want to keep as many of those natural areas uh, in their current state, both for climate perspectives and for habitat perspectives. Um, I want to thank everybody who has been on Zoom today. I know it's been uh, a lot of information coming at you. Um, I did want to, before I thank our presenters, just to end up by saying that, you know, as, as again, Brian talked about earlier, there's a lot of choices that have to be made. And New York State will be making a lot of choices about where it allocates state resources in terms of the climate that the, the climate action plan and which areas get funded. So I think it really is important for us to keep in mind that um, we have Tom Algeyer here from Department of Ag and Markets, but we want to continue to make sure the state funds the inspection services. They're the folks who are inspecting our greenhouses, inspecting at our ports, really trying to keep new pests and pathogens from coming in. We do also want to make sure that our Department of Environmental Conservation has that rapid response capability. They did an amazing job when HWA first hit Lake George. That's not capacity that can continue to be sustained under their current budget levels. So we wanna make sure that that funding be, is available to the state. And also we will need, as Sue points out, we will need resources for private landowners. You know, we all want to keep um, our standing carbon standing. And as HWA and other forest pests and pathogen come in, that's going to be one of the most important ways we can help New York State meet, we collectively can help New York State meet the climate law. And that's also really important. Um, I really want to do a shout out to all of those who are managing our waters in New York State uh, and here in the Adirondacks, those who are doing the prevention and the monitoring. Because as Molly said, prevention is the best bet. And as our waters continue to warm, they will become more, uh, more favorable for a lot of the invasive species. So the monitoring efforts and the prevention efforts that we're all doing here are really serving New York well in terms of uh, being able to preserve our biodiversity and meet the state's climate goals. So with that, I'm going to thank all of our presenters today for doing like an amazing job. Um, I work with these guys, men and women, uh, all the time. And when they present, I'm just so stunned and so impressed at you know the work that they're, they're able to do and we collectively are able to do in this region. So thanks to our presenters. And I'm gonna stop the recording.